Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sony A6400, based on shooting with it at the launch event, as well as testing it independently around San Diego and back at home in Brighton afterwards. The A6400 is a mid-range mirrorless camera with a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, 4K video, built-in viewfinder, and a touchscreen that flips up by 180 degrees to face the subject. It costs around $900 or pounds for the body only and it's officially the successor to the A6300 but as you'll discover in this video it could end up being more tempting than the pricier A6500 depending on your needs. I'll start with the sensor, a 24 megapixel APS-C part inherited from the A6300 and A6500. This means it also inherits a hybrid AF system for confident focusing across the frame, although it's now coupled with Sony's latest algorithms, which I'll demonstrate in just a moment. Sadly, the A6400 does not offer built-in stabilization, leaving this as a unique advantage of the A6500 in Sony's APS-C range, at least for now. I'm frustrated by this as I really like to use prime lenses, which often don't have stabilization of their own, but equally it's allowed the A6400 to hit a lower price point than the A6500. The body will also look familiar, it's based on the A6300 and I'm told it has the same degree of weather sealing as that and the A6500. There's the shutter release and power collar joined by one custom button versus two on the A6500, the main mode dial and the first of two control dials. Round the back you'll find a thumb wheel and the second custom button. So far so similar to the A6300 but there's one major difference, a new screen mechanism which after flipping up by 90 degrees can be pulled outwards then flipped a further 90 degrees in order to clear the viewfinder housing and face forward. It's slightly awkward but for the first time in the A6000 series it allows you to see yourself for vlogging or selfies. There is however one major catch, if you mount an accessory on the hot shoe like an external microphone then you'll block the screen in this position. The solution is to either mount a microphone on a bracket to the side of the camera or to connect a cabled mic like a lav. I'd have preferred the flexibility of a side hinge screen but in its defence Sony's solution remains central to the optical axis and it's also quicker to angle up for a discrete shot. There's pros and cons to both approaches. In terms of the screen panel itself, Sony's equipped the A6400 with a 3 inch screen with 921K dots and a 16x9 aspect ratio. Now this is quite unusual for most digital cameras because it means that if you're shooting in the native 3x2 image shape, you'll see black bars running down the right and left sides because the image won't fill the screen. However, if you go through the display options, you'll see that Sony does use this extra screen real estate for shooting information like these icons running down the left and right sides. And of course, if you are shooting in the 16 by 9 ratio, such as if you're filming movies, then that image will fill the screen. And this, of course, is a benefit of this type of screen over more traditional digital cameras, which would uh, display a 16 by 9 image with black bars along the top and the bottom. So pros and cons to each approach. Now, like the A6500, the screen here is touch sensitive, thank goodness, which means you can tap to reposition the focusing area. You can use it to pull focus, as I'm doing here for movies, and of course use it to adjust the AF area when you're shooting stills. If I go into the menus here and have a look at the touch menus, you can see that you can also use the touch screen as a touch pad. This means that you can actually use your thumb to move the AF area while you're composing through the viewfinder, and that works quite well. It's not quite a great substitute for a dedicated AF joystick, which you would have, say, here, but it is still a reasonable compromise nonetheless. And you can choose which part of the screen area you want to remain active. However, that's about it for touch controls. If you go into the menus, as I am here, you can't touch to scroll through them or select them. If we bring up the function menu here, you can see these lovely icons just waiting to be tapped, but unfortunately they're going to stay waiting for a bit longer. Come on, even Fujifilm's fixed that. And if you go into playback, of course you'd be able to swipe through images, right? Wrong! You can't even do that. However, you can do a double tap to zoom in on the picture, at which point the screen suddenly becomes all touchy-feely again and you can actually scroll around the picture very nicely. If only we could do more with this touchscreen though. So Sony, see if you can fix that please. 
But just before moving on, there's one other upgrade that I want to mention, and this is over all the A6000 models that preceded it. Now, this screen, like a lot of uh, Sony screens, is not particularly bright as standard. It's fine when you're using it indoors, but as soon as you take it outdoors, it becomes washed out very quickly. The solution, of course, is to increase the monitor brightness and I can do that as before and set the sunny weather option. This is going to make the screen nice and bright. However, at this point, previous models like the A65 and A6300 would not let you film in 4K or at the high frame rate 120p 1080. However, check this out. If I scroll along through these menus back to the movie mode, we can see here that I am set to 4K and I can start filming with the sunny weather monitor. Now it's looking a bit bright in this video now because I'm indoors at the moment, but believe me, you really need that sunny weather option when you're filming outdoors. And previously that ruled out filming using the screen in 4K, you'd have to use the viewfinder outside. However, now with the 6400, you can film 4K or 1080 at 120p outside under really bright conditions with the sunny weather setting on the monitor. So thanks for that upgrade, Sony. If you prefer to compose at eye level, there's a built-in electronic viewfinder inherited from the A6300 and A6500 with an XGA OLED panel, par for the course at this level. As I mentioned earlier, you can use the touchscreen to adjust the autofocus area when composing with the viewfinder. With the same body as the A6300, it's not surprising to find the same ports too. Micro HDMI with 4K output, micro USB which can be used for charging, and powering the camera as well as data transfer, and a 3.5mm microphone input. Although again, remember, if you mount a microphone on the hot shoe, you'll block the screen from facing you. No surprises to find the same battery pack as the previous A6000 models either. The venerable NPFW50, quoted for around 400 photos or 70 minutes worth of video. In practice, I managed closer to 200 photos with a few minutes of 4K video on a single charge. That's below average nowadays, and I wish Sony would deploy a new battery on the APS-C models. Perhaps that same one that's on the current A7 series. But remember, Sony does support the fairly unique ability to actually run the camera for a USB source like a power bank, and I'll show an example of that running later. Moving on to autofocus, the A6400 debuts Sony's latest tracking system with real-time IAF. With the shutter half-pressed, the camera can now exploit eye detection with continuous autofocus, something which previously required you to awkwardly hold another button down at the same time, and it's stickier than ever before, even from a distance. If the camera loses the eye, it falls back to face detection, and if it loses that, then it goes to normal object tracking, before then picking them up again quickly and seamlessly. This new tracking mode replaces the lock-on AF modes on previous models, and it just works brilliantly. The A6400 will also support Sony's new animal eye detection with a firmware update, but this wasn't ready when I tested it. Here's the tracking system again, locked onto the logo on the glass, and see how easily it follows it across the frame, even when moving back and forth. Apart from Sony's own A9, is the best tracking I've tested, although in low light it can struggle with the kit zoom in continuous autofocus, so for the best results, try and couple it with faster, brighter lenses. In terms of burst, the A6400 can shoot at up to 8 frames per second with live-ish feedback between frames, or 11 frames per second with slightly delayed feedback. The top speed is greatly dependent on the AF mode, lens and subject though. I managed a burst of 114 JPEGs in 10.32 seconds, which works out at a top speed of 11 frames per second, but that was in AFS, single AF mode. With continuous autofocus, I typically achieved closer to between 5 and 8 frames per second, but that's still good enough to capture most action. Like the A6300 and A6500 before it, the A6400 offers a silent mode, which employs an electronic shutter to operate in complete silence. This is great for times when you need to be discreet, but like most electronic shutters, there can be skewing if the subject moves quickly or you're panning. Here's a panning sequence snapped with the mechanical shutter where the pillars remain vertical, as you'd hope. And now again, panning with the silent shutter where they're sloping diagonally. It's also worth noting the fastest shutter speed remains 1 over 4,000th of a second, where most rivals offer something quicker, even if only using their electronic shutters. In an upgrade over the A6300, the A6400 gains the Bluetooth capabilities of the A6500, which allow it to maintain a low power connection with your phone and seamlessly embed location coordinates if you like. 
it works really well in practice. Meanwhile, Wi-Fi and NFC remain available for copying images or wireless remote control. After abandoning downloadable apps, Sony's recent cameras have frustratingly lacked any kind of interval timer facilities, but I'm delighted to report the A6400 is the first new model from Sony to feature the capability built into the menus as standard, which is where they really should have always been. Now you can set the A6400 to record frames at preset intervals, and while it won't generate a movie in camera, it can provide a rough preview in playback, and Sony also supplies desktop software for making your own time-lapse movies with these frames. The interval timer should also come to the A9, A7 III and A7R III with a firmware update, but no news yet on any older models. Now it's time to examine the image quality and I'll start with an ISO sequence going through the sensitivity range. Here's the full image and I'll show enlargements next for closer examination. I'd say the A6400 delivers clean results up to 800 ISO and looks good at 1600 ISO too. At 3200 ISO noise becomes more visible with 6400 ISO arguably as far as you'd want to go at least when viewing at 100%. The A6400 continues up to extended sensitivities up to 102,400 ISO, but these higher settings are really best reserved for emergency use. Now for a selection of sample images I shot with the A6400 in a variety of lenses, mostly the 18 to 135mm kit zoom and the 24mm f1.8 prime. You can take a closer look at these in my review at cameralabs.com. Overall, the image quality is what you'd expect from a modern APS-C camera, and while the sensor is the same as its recent predecessors, the A6400 is coupled with Sony's latest image processing, which to my eyes, delivers more natural colours and skin tones than before. Like other Sony cameras, Auto ISO is a highlight with minimum shutter speeds influenced not only by focal length, but also by additional options to speed up or slow down the shutter. I ended up choosing the faster option to reduce the risk of camera shake on unstabilised lenses or motion blur in street photography. It's really nice to be able to customise it to this degree. Like its recent predecessors, burst shooting is also a highlight, especially coupled with the improved autofocus system. This is a camera that will confidently handle active kids, pets and many sports too, at least when fitted with a decent lens. Moving on to video, the A6400 can film 1080p up to 60p without a crop, or up to 120p with a crop. It'll also film 4K in 24 or 25p without a crop, or at 30p with a crop. To demonstrate the quality and crop factor, here's 1080 footage filmed at 60p with the 24mm f1.8, where there's no crop horizontally. And now, here's how it looks with the same lens, but filmed in 1080 at 120 p where the A6400 applies a small reduction in the field of view. Next, here's the A6400 filming in 4K at 24p with the same lens, again with no horizontal crop at this, or indeed at 25p. And for comparison, here it is in 4K at 30p with the reduction in the field of view. In all these respects, it's the same as the A6300 and the A6500 before it. If you're into grading, you'll be pleased to find S-Log2 and S-Log3 in the picture profiles, and new to the A6400, the addition of hybrid log gamma for in-camera HDR. As I mentioned earlier, Sony is one of the few companies that can actually run their cameras from a USB source, like I'm doing here with a small power bank battery. This is allowing me to film a long clip in 4K, even though the internal battery started with just 5% charge. But look at that recording time in the corner of the screen. The A6400 joins an exclusive club of cameras that can film beyond the usual half hour limit. I managed just over an hour's worth of 4K 30p at 60 megabits with a single clip on a 64 gigabyte card without any overheating issues. This is impressive stuff, especially if you're into filming events or interviews. There's no eye detection when filming movies, but face detection works a treat, even with large aperture lenses like the 24mm f1.8, which I used to film this clip in 4K. It also reacquires me without any issues as I duck in and out of the frame, making it great for vloggers who are working by themselves. Face tracking also works well with longer lenses. I filmed Steve Huff here in 4K, handheld, with the FE 70-200mm G Master at 200mm f2.8, and again it keeps me in focus easily. Canon's the only other company that's this good for face tracking in video, but at this price, Canon will only do it in 1080p, so if you want 4K with great autofocusing, Sony's the way to go. 
The touchscreen may have been available on the A6500, but it remains an important upgrade over the A6300 and the older A6000, allowing you to tap to pull focus. I filmed this in 4K with the 24mm f1.8. You can also adjust the tracking speed for movies. In this clip, I set it to slow for a much more gentle focus pull. Or if you're out of town and you just want the quickest response, here's how it looks set to fast. Like most cameras, the A6400 is susceptible to rolling shutter if you swing it around as evidenced here, but keep the motion more gentle and it will behave much better. Now for a quick vlogging clip, and that rattling sound you might hear in the background is the strap lug, so if you're into that, best stick it down in future. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is a quick vlogging test with the Sony A6400. Here filming in 4K at 30p, which does incur a little crop, but I'm using the widest lens in the E system, the 10 to 18 millimeter at 10. So hopefully I'm not too big on the frame. There is a Canadian coming behind me, do not be alarmed. Apparently he also has a channel. Is it still hanging on to you, Gordon, or is it excited to see me too? It's always excited to see you, Jordan. These guys, these guys, I can't shift, I can't shift these guys. Oh no, they've gone, we're all right. Sorry for that minor interruption there. So I'm using the 10 to 18 millimeter, so at 10 millimeter, even with that little crop at 30p, we're still getting a nice wide field of view. And of course, the thing that makes the A6400 unique in the range at the moment is it's the only 6000 series with a screen that flips up forward to face you, which is obviously great for vlogging, but it's not very useful if you've got a microphone mounted on the hot shoe because it's going to block it. But you could, of course, attach it to the side or use a lav mic, you know, or <clears throat> maybe even some sort of road video micro if you could attach that to the microphone input on the side. So probably the most practical camera in the Sony range at the moment for vlogging. And now for some 1080 clips filmed in 120p and slowed by four times on my 30p timeline. 1080 at 120p has become a fairly standard feature for Sony, but it's not available on all rivals, and usefully the A6400 will record 1080 120p with audio, and it also still works with continuous autofocus. And finally, the S&Q mode stands for slow and quick, generating up to 5 times slow motion or 60 times time-lapse style video clips in camera, albeit only at 1080p. This is a 60 times clip. Sony's A6400 is a solid mid-range mirrorless camera with an APS-C sensor delivering good quality 24 megapixel photos and 4K video. Improvements to the autofocus system means it will track and stay focused on subjects more successfully than any camera at its price point, whether you're shooting stills or filming video. And fast burst speeds means it's also better suited to shooting action than most rivals too. The screen can finally flip up by 180 degrees to face you for vlogging, and the rare ability to keep filming beyond half an hour makes it ideal for interviews and events. Frustratingly, if you fit a microphone to the hot shoe, you'll block the screen, but you could always use a bracket to mount it or a cabled microphone instead. And while there's no headphone jack, well, that's normal at this price point. I'd have liked to see a better battery, but you can at least power the camera over USB, which is useful for long videos, or time lapses, which have also been reinstated after the loss of downloadable apps. Arguably the biggest downside though is the lack of built-in image stabilization, which remains exclusive to the A6500 in Sony's APS-C range. It's annoying since it's long been standard across Sony's full-frame line. If you do need IBIS, perhaps for unstabilized primes, then the A6500 is still tempting, even at its higher price, but I personally prefer the A6400 for its improved focusing, the longer recording times, and the selfie screen, even with the hot shoe limitations. Since the previous A6500 followed the A6300 by only 8 months though, it also begs the question whether there'll be a stabilised version of the A6400 in the future. I've got absolutely no idea, although presumably it would be at a premium price that you may not be willing to pay. Plus, if you don't need the A6400's upgrades, look out for discounted A6300's. And if you don't need 4K or fast bursts, Canon's EOS M50 remains a great option for vloggers with a side hinge screen and a lower price. But personally speaking, the A6400 fits very well with my style of filming, and lack of IBIS aside, it's a strong camera at the price point and one that I'm happy to recommend. If you found this review useful, please give me a like, and if you haven't already subscribed, please give me a follow and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of my videos. And if you really, really like it, you can support my work by checking prices or treating me to a coffee using the links below. 
Cheers. If you're into photography without post-processing, also check out my in-camera book, which tells the story behind 100 of my favourite travel photos, all JPEGs out of camera with no Photoshop or Lightroom. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Camera Labs. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.